Welcome to another Vasculitis Foundation webinar. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational webinar series. And I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. This webinar is one in a series of short interviews with doctors who attended the 2023 American Society of Nephrology annual meeting. And today we have with us Dr. Elizabeth Brandt. Dr. Brandt earned her medical degree at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. She completed residency in internal medicine at Tulane University Hospital and Clinic in New Orleans. She completed a nephrology fellowship at the University of North Carolina Medical Center in Chapel Hill, followed by a Vasculitis Foundation Fellowship. And she practices at Dartmouth Hitch. Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Welcome, Dr. Brandt, and thank you so much for being with us today. Good morning, Kathy. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you. You know, Dr. Brandt, you were recently at the uh, ASN annual meeting, and for those of you who don't know, this is a multi-day convention where nephrologists from all around the world come together. Yeah. Could you tell us uh, what were some of the main takeaways or highlights from the meeting? I mean, I'm a vasculitis patient with kidney involvement, so I'd like to know, did you learn about any new research or clinical studies or things that are relevant to people like me? And and if you wouldn't mind giving us any disclosures you have before you get started. Yeah, so I don't have any disclosures. That part is very easy. So I jotted some notes. So if I look down, it's because I'm looking at my little notes I made to myself. So um what was interesting, now I had not been able to go to the ASN during COVID um, and, and I typically went every year. So first of all, it was just wonderful to go back. I just, it was wonderful. I, you, nephrology is kind of a small community. So you see people that you know, um, there have been years past when I, would, when I would run into nephrologists that I knew from when I was in med school, who she would still remember me and we would chat. So um, so that, that was really great. Um, it was it was interesting this year because in years past, at least uh, when I had been going, um, there was always quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a number of talks about vasculitis. And this year there was very little. Now, I don't want that to sound like, oh, well, then, you know, what's the point? Why are we talking today? But I think there are um, a couple of, I think, important highlights. Um, so. There was one talk that um, that I was at about management of vasculitis. There wasn't a ton of new information in that talk, except for one thing that I'll tell you about. There was another talk on IgA vasculitis that I didn't get into, um, but at some point I'll go back and, and listen to that online. But um, I, I heard it was standing room only, and I so I don't know much there. But anyway, that was kind of it, really. So as far as ANCA specifically, in this talk about management, one uh, new treatment that they did bring up is this drug. It's an oral medication called Avacapan or Tavnios is how the patients know it. Um, it was just approved in October of 2021 in the U.S. It was actually approved prior to that in Japan and then since being looked at in other countries. Um, and it's for use in patients with severe ANCA-associated vasculitis in conjunction with other therapies like rituximab, corticosteroids, in patients with kidney involvement. Um, the, the whole point of the trial that led to approval was that it looked at the effect of avacapan on kidney function. Um, so this drug is very different than anything that we've had so far. You know, we've had cyclophosphamide that kind of does a wide sweep of the immune system. We have glucocorticoids that help with inflammation, but a lot of adverse effects. Um, and we've got rituximab, much more targeted, just gets rid of a small population of B cells, huge, you know, kind of earth shattering discovery there. But this drug is what's called a C5A receptor inhibitor. Blah, 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 blah. The C stands for complement, complement 5A. And just, I can't even begin to explain the complement system. So here's what you're going to learn from me about that. Very simply, uh, that part of the immune system plays a role in amplifying inflammation and the immune response. So it leads to this kind of vicious cycle of inflammation um, and autoimmunity. So what avacapan does, it interrupts that. So it really seems to shut down the inflammation in a way, and this is my own perception having used it, in a way that I don't even see with steroids. Uh, it seems to be quite effective and quickly um, has been what 
what I have observed in my patients that I have on it. Um, so it's not, again, not intended to replace other therapies, but be kind of an adjunct, uh, just an additional line of defense. And again, I've been using it in a few patients. Um, the process of getting it is pretty straightforward. A uh, lot of patient assistance because as a new drug, of course, it costs, you know, $7 million or something per person per day. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, but uh, but I think we're going to be learning more about that drug and how best to use it and how long to use it and all that kind of thing as we go along because it is really quite new. Um, what's also interesting about that drug is it's now being studied in other forms of autoimmune kidney disease, including IgA nephropathy. Now, some of the folks that are watching may be familiar with IgA vasculitis, also called henoch schoenlein purpura. Um, and IgA nephropathy is part of that spectrum that IgA vasculitis is also on. Um, and IgA was the other, I think, single biggest topic. There, there were two. IgA was one of them. And then I'm going to tell you about the second one. Um, but that was one of the biggest topics of the entire meeting. And I think it's because we've just been at a loss to how to treat it. It's it's of the autoimmune kidney diseases, it's the most common, and yet it's the one we seem to have the least good handle on how to treat it. Um, so they're looking at a backup plan for that, which I think is great. I think if it seems to work well, I wouldn't be surprised if we then see that uh, knowledge transferred over to IgA vasculitis. I would think it might work very well. That's just my speculation, but um, but I, I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I think in general, um, what we're seeing um, in a very concerted way is that existing drugs, new drugs, drugs under development, um, they're being studied as potential treatment in multiple diseases. It's not just, oh, here is this thing for that, and here's this thing for that. Um, and we've done this all along. Rituximab is the perfect example of that, right? It, used in cancer, then used in vasculitis, now used in many forms of autoimmune kidney disease uh, uh, to great, great effect. So um, uh, so even though um, some of this stuff is not vasculitis specific, development of a therapy for one of these rare kidney diseases is likely to be beneficial in one or more other of these forms of kidney disease. So, um, and, and as we develop the drugs, we um, get more targeted, we better understand the disease and the process of developing the drug. That understanding leads to development of additional drugs and so on. So it, it really is a, a way to sort of magnify the benefit. Um, and as nephrologist, we have to be aware of these things that are in the pipeline because what's going to happen is things are going to change quickly enough that if you don't stay on top of it, you're going to be using older treatments when there are newer things that might be more effective, better tolerated, fewer side effects and that sort of thing. Um, so that we have to do that. We just have to stay on top of that. Um, and the, this idea of de developing more targeted therapies in general for kidney disease, that's that's been discussion forever. But I think we're starting to see more and more of that and more success in that. Even in some of the genetic diseases, we're starting to see some therapies, which is quite um, spectacular. So the other big, big topic that I wanted to talk about that is not at all vasculitis specific, but it is so important. There's a new-ish class of medication called SGLT2 inhibitors. And I'm sure some of the people watching are on one of them. There are things like empagliflozin, so things that end with flozin. Um, so this was, pro along with IgA, SGLT2 inhibitors were probably the single biggest topic of discussion at the entire meeting. That's how important these meds are. So again, not specific for vasculitis. In fact, their initial role was for treatment of diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. So what does that have to do with vasculitis? What's happened is that we've learned that these drugs are so beneficial to patients with kidney disease, chronic kidney disease of any cause, that that they literally are kind of a miracle drug. And I don't say that lightly, like the effects from them are ex really quite extraordinary. So the reason I want to point that out is, again, I'm a nephrologist. I treat patients with vasculitis. That's, you know, my primary thing. But 
many of these patients have chronic kidney disease because they had vasculitis that affected their kidneys. So I don't, I can't just treat their vasculitis and be like, see you later. No, I have to treat their chronic kidney disease and manage that. And, you know, for those who have chronic kidney disease, they know that as that advances, there are more and more complications and I have to do all of that. And so these drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, those are now a mainstay, should be a mainstay. They're, they're terribly underutilized thus far, um, just like drugs like lisinopril and losartan that we know are very beneficial to patients, very underprescribed, despite the fact that we know that. So SGLT2s in the same way, if we can get on board with prescribing them along with things like lisinopril, the, the benefit to patients is just going to be mind blowing, really. Um, so, uh, so we have to get comfortable and I, I will readily admit that I have not been comfortable prescribing them. Like I know of the benefit, but then I'm like, well, I'll just mention in my note that maybe they'd want to consider starting that. And then I'm leaving it up to a primary care provider or their diabetes provider or their cardiologist or anyone but me <laughs> to do it. And, and really the takeaway, big takeaway for me was you cannot wait for someone else to do it. You just have to get comfortable. So as nephrologists, we really are obligated to embrace this class of medications because a, a patient with vasculitis and chronic kidney disease is still going to benefit from these. I don't care what the cause of their chronic kidney disease is, but as my vasculitis patients who have chronic kidney disease, I have to be able to give them all the best options, not just the best options for their vasculitis. I mean, I can get them in remission, but I can't necessarily undo the damage that's occurred. What I can do is try to prevent more damage from happening, even when they don't have active vasculitis. So um, so that was a nonspecific, but sort of very much a practice changing message that I took away from the meeting. Wow, I don't think we've heard from anybody about that. That is exciting news. And um, I think vasculitis patients in particular with kidney involvement are going to write these notes down and talk to their doctors about it. So we really, yeah. really appreciate you bringing that up today. Yeah, and they they really, they really should. I will say, I, I actually didn't understand this until this amazing talk that was given by one of the people who helped develop these drugs. Her name is Kathy Tuttle. She also won a huge award at ASN, as she should. Um, I did know that when you start them, there's actually a little decline in the kidney function, and we call it the dip. There's this dip, and then it'll come back up, but it might not even come back to where it was before, and you think, well, that's terrible. That's lowering my kidney function. However, it's actually a good thing because what it's doing is the kidneys um, and patients who have diabetes, high blood pressure, all these things, heart failure, they have something called hyperfiltration. So their kidneys are overworking. Um, and so what these drugs do is they decrease the hyperfiltration. So it looks like the kidney function is decreasing, but really it's the stress on the kidneys that's decreasing. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a decline. I mean, you don't want it to be cut by 50%, but a little bit of a dip in the kidney function is perfectly okay. And so just people should not be shocked when they see it and they're like, my numbers are worse. It's all because of this med. Well, yeah, it probably is. And I hope so. <laughs> so. <laughs> Gosh, well, thank you for explaining that. I, I have a Tavnios question just because it is becoming more and more well-known in the patient world. We're all okay. talking about it because we all sort of hate corticosteroids steroids, even though they're super important. Yeah. Um, is Tavnios pill form or infusion form or how is that done? Yeah, great question. It's a pill form. It's come the, the dosage, it only comes in one dosage of each capsule is 10 milligrams. And it's three tablets, uh, three uh, capsules in the morning and three in the evening. So the total dose is 30 milligrams twice a day. I have maybe, I want to say, five or so patients on it. So not a million patients. Um, and I can explain why that is, but, um, and so far everybody is tolerating it very well. Um, I don't want to speak for the company, uh, which is now Amgen. It was developed by Chemocentrics, but they were 
bought by Amgen. So now it's Amgen that uh, is sort of distributing that. But they have a very excellent patient assistance program. I have one patient who pays $10 a month for it. My other patients don't pay a single penny for it. They, at the end of this year, they have to sort of re-enroll, you know, demonstrate that they, because it really is insanely expensive otherwise. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty simple process to go through once you kind of figure out the logistics of it. Um, so, so I've been pleased by that. But it's, it's, so the reason I only have a few people on it is um, I was on the committee during sort of the FDA talks about whether it should be approved or not. And I had some reservations, but, you know, you're, you're working with the data that are in front of you and everybody did, everybody had reservations and, but people had different reservations, which was kind of funny. Um, so, but it did get approved. I'm, I'm very happy that it did. And so I had a couple patients. I had one lady who, I mean, she's going to end up on dialysis anyway. However, I was trying to just, I could not get her in remission. Like I could, I could not get her kidney disease in remission. I tried everything I had. So I said, let's try it. We tried it, she still has very low kidney function, but it it's just stabilized. So that's great. I have another patient had came in, previously a healthy guy, comes into the hospital, creatinine of eight, ah, <laughs> has, has vasculitis, started treating him. He initially was doing very well. And then I see him in clinic and the creatinine had gone back up a little bit. I was like, are you staying well hydrated? Anyway, his, his, his kidney function was getting worse as I was treating him and I was like, what are you doing? Like, that is not how this is supposed to go. <laughs> like that's wrong. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, switching his other meds around a little bit, I put him on Tavnios and within three weeks, his creatinine went down to the lowest it had been since his diagnosis. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was really quite remarkable. Um, it did not prevent him from flaring again recently. He flared after he got COVID. He got vasculitis the first time right after he got COVID. I think there is a link there. Um, but uh, but otherwise, that, that seems to be working well. And again, people are tolerating it quite well. So, Well, that is one of the questions that's been burning in my brain because everybody's talking about it. And I just wondered, well, if we had to have it, how would we have it? Because those of us that have to have infusions sometimes have special circumstances going into the hospital, inpatient sometimes even. So I was just wondering about that. So that's great that you clarified that. And I'm happy that you have some patients that you're working with it on and that all these new things that, that you told us about today are really exciting for patients like me. So I wanted to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and time with us today. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you.